Welcome to another episode of Data Journeys. I'm Bruno Aziza, and this is the place you come to learn from data and analytics leaders, their successes, their growth, their best practices, and their worst practices. And today, I have the pleasure to talk to Matt. He's the Chief Data Architect at Money Supermarket Group. Matt, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you for having me, Bruno. All right, well, so you won one of the Customer of the Year awards this year, and you've got lots of best practices, but let's get started with the basics. What does the company do? Well, we set out our purpose and our mission is to, to save UK households money. So we're one of the UK's leading um, price comparison websites, so offering insurance products, home services, and money products to, to the entire UK. That's excellent. And tell us a little bit about your data situation, federated and siloed data, the need for agility. What's the, the picture for your company for data? Yeah, well, this is actually the third marketplace business I've worked in. And um, marketplaces are, are great for data. And Money Supermarket is, you know, it's a data business. So we get so much information from customers when they're sort of buying products and filling question sets. But what we have found is, you know, lots of our data is just siloed in different tech stacks for different channels. And the business has grown, you know, really well commercially and successfully. But the, the cost of that has been just that, that sort of siloed piece of data. So we find lots of projects that start and you know where it begins. It's sort of, can we get the data and sort of working with different tech teams? And I think, you know, we are a digital business and we've just got so many engineers making changes across all those those channels. So keeping up with the rate of change and evolving schemas is it's been a real, a real challenge for us and something that we're trying to solve now through for a bit, bit a bit of a platform play really to try and sort of bring all this data together into a central place. So take us through that journey. What does it look like when you produce so much data and, and data from everywhere, really, and then try and bring it into one place? What does the journey look like? Yeah, I think um, it's really it's really interesting for me. I think, you know, being the receiver and the consumer of all this data can be really challenging. So, you know, one of the, the sort of tech um, principles, which I, you know, which I think is really good is the the front end is very event based so we have lots of sort of semi structured low latency data flowing through through kafka um so really our challenge was how do we start to build our data platform so it's event driven so it sort of works well with that event architecture i think where we came from is you can fall into a bit of a trap where you just want to sort of try and batch that event data up to ingest it through traditional etl tools and i think one thing that we've really focused on with it, with our journey um, with GCP is how do we be event first in terms of how we collect that data across all of those different teams. Now, two million events per day. What types of data, uh, you know, are are you using? What is the data that's coming through, and what do you do with it? Yeah, I mean that, that's that's the, the the biggest question for us. Where the most value is? So yeah, we do we do ingest two million events per day. They come from a whole range of different microservices. It could be events that are related to customers running inquiries on the website. Could be results coming back to them. Um, it could also be click out events where they're clicking through to a to one of our providers to to complete a purchase. Or it could be a new product going live. Um, our real sort of challenge is how do we collect all of that data and bring it into, into one place? One of the biggest sort of use cases we have for data, and I think loads of people relate to this, is how can we use our data to be more efficient in how we acquire customers? So if we know about our customers and we know how many inquiries they've done, you know, how can we tell who, the, who our best customers are? And then when they're in the PPC world or trying to search through web or, or Google, how can we target them with the, with the better offers and better prices? But there are a whole host of other sort of use cases too. I think one area we want to get to sort of over the next year is definitely how we make our business more efficient. So how do we give them more data so they can run, you know, make better led decisions than, than they do today? Now, of course, you've got all types of data, semi-structured, structured, some of it's sensitive, some of it's less sensitive. So tell us a little bit about how you deal with the sensitivity of your data. Yeah, I think I think that's the, one of the, the things we're most proud of. So, you know, for the last year, we've set ourselves out on a, a strategy to sort of re-platform and bring our data together in BigQuery. And, you know, we deliberately picked BigQuery because of its use of policy tags. So within those 2 million events we ingest per day, there's a total of around 64,000 columns or data points. So our challenge really, what we're trying to solve for is how do we give people access to those 64,000 columns without letting them see sensitive information and building using policy tags 
to enforce our data classification was was key to our success. So you can almost imagine we built this um, sort of taxonomy, this hierarchy of what our data looks like in terms of classifications. And we've applied that into our data via BigQuery. So as soon as you open BigQuery now, you can see all of the columns, but you can see what classification they have. So that's been a big win for us. And the architecture looks like sub sub data flow BigQuery. Take us a little bit through the stack and how do you organize yourself as well as the, the talent around the this new architecture you've been building over the last few years? Yeah, it's um it's really interesting. So, you know, before you know, we had an 11 step process that got data from um from source into a data platform. It's a bit like sort of dancing with the stars, to be honest. Like, you know, how many other sort of routines have that many steps? So we actually managed to simplify it quite a lot. So yeah, we take we have a consumer that brings the data over from Kafka and we land it into PubSub, um, which is great. So we've always got a copy of our data in PubSub for us to start processing. At that point in time, we use Dataflow to bring that data into, into BigQuery. And it's got a few tricks. So that classification process I talked about, Dataflow is, is the tool that we use to enforce all of that. It's also the tool that we use to take some you know quite gnarly JSON and put it into a nice friendly um, BigQuery table. So if you looked in our environment, you would just see a simple here's a bit here's an event that just flows through into its own destination table, and we have sort of one table per topic. And um, what that means is that if you're an analyst, you can just write a simple few lines of SQL to get hold of any raw data. So you know bye bye to building Jupyter notebooks and Python code to open flat files, it's kind of all there waiting for you. That process sort of pubs up data flow BigQuery takes about three seconds. So that's the sort of average time we see an event um, loading from Kafka right the way through into BigQuery. And so you mentioned many steps before, how many steps do you have now? And what's been kind of the, the strategy for scaling to new volumes of data? Yeah, so I think um, it's 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 three to four steps now, depending on sort of which route the the data takes, which is which is great. So that's really helped us get really close to, I guess, where our customers are putting in data and where our analysts can can see um, that information in real time. Our strategy, you know, again, that sort of reinforced why we picked PubSub and Dataflow. So we had um, a, a task to so we we built this data platform, we launched it, we we collected all the new data. But we had three years of history sitting in S3. Um, so over a weekend, we set ourselves the challenge of ingesting all of that data, replaying it through our pipeline. Um, and it took it took the weekend, um, but it was around, um, we, our pipeline scaled up to 150 workers. So normally it's around four workers in Dataflow, scaled to 150, processed um, almost 7 million flat files and 150 terabytes of data. And it did that without anyone having to do anything like it automatically scaled. So our analysts went home on Friday night with um, just seeing a bit, you know, recent data. They came back Monday morning and there was three years of history sitting in BigQuery. So, you know, that was phenomenal. That's pretty amazing from a, a different cloud into the Google cloud over a weekend. That's uh, not a surprise then. Then you got the customer of the year award. Now let's uh, drive into your experience. You know, beyond just this company, you, you this is not your first rodeo in the data world and building intelligent data lakes like this one. What are your best and worst practices? Let's start with the best practices. Let's, let's start with the good news. What are the few things that you think is essential for anyone starting on a journey that's similar to yours? What should they be thinking about first? I think one, I think simplify, try and keep things simple. And there's a there's a couple of best practices that I think I've learned along the way. The one is, you know, the technology's moved on so much that you don't have to worry about transforming data before you store it. So I think things like BigQuery and storing raw data and just loading it. So you get a source data and you just load it into the same format. You don't try and restructure it or transform it. I think that that simplifies things. And, you know, I've you hear this term called dark data and I sort of really point that term at where people are trying to transform the data and you get all this raw data that just disappears. And we found about 80% of the data that was flowing through the business never got, never was seen by an analyst. So I think to try and solve that, just landing data in its raw format is, is, is a good option. 
I think the other thing I've learned in, you know, the amount of jobs I've been into where there's been capacity problems on a Monday morning or at month end and trying to plan how much infrastructure you need. Like, do you plan for the peak? Do you plan for the medium? Do you sacrifice if you go for the medium that people are going to be complaining that things run slow on a Monday? Like, that's a thing of the past with serverless as well. So I think, you know, it doesn't take the problem away completely, but I think it really gives people the opportunity to focus on building rather than trying to sort of solve a gnarly problem like how much infrastructure you need. Um, so I think they would be the, the two big things from, from, you know, typical sort of projects I've experienced in the past. I think the final one would be privacy is becoming more of a thing. And it's not, I, I think, you know, in the UK legislation around GDPR and, and cookies, it's only going one way. So it's going to become a bigger thing. So I think focusing on privacy from the start is a lot easier than trying to do it once you've launched a platform. So again, you know, it might take a little bit longer, but focusing on sort of classification policy tags, getting people used to using pseudonymized data and not real data is, you know, is a big thing to is a big thing to focus on. This is interesting what you're saying around the switching from ETL to ALT because so much of the data gets lost in the shuffle if if you do it the other way. Uh, I'm sure that's that's a good one for people to uh, take on. Now, what about the opposite of that? What are the worst practices? Maybe the lessons that you've learned either personally or you've witnessed others and that you think, you know, you got to watch out for it. It might make sense at first, but actually is not the first thing to start with. You know, that's a really good question. I sort of, you, you sort of warmed me up to this before and I was trying to think to it, like there's been loads of sort of mistakes that we've made along the way. I think, you know, if I look back to previous roles, um we ended up building a lot more than we perhaps should have so you know i definitely things are moving so fast in the data space so you know using things like composer using things like workflow um really save your time rather than sort of building your own sort of orchestration um element or, or, or you know framework for processing data i think that would be one um i think the other piece is um probably around sort of capacity as well so I hadn't realized how sort of flexible it is to think about your project structure in GCP and what things you put where and what users you put where and service accounts. And I think that plays a big part as well. So, you know, we spent a lot of time cleaning up where our service accounts live, what project and what, um, how many slots that project gets versus where all our users sit and where, how many slots they get. So I think it would be spend a bit of time on the things that you don't really appreciate have a big impact. Well, Matt, thank you so much for the insights today. Going from ETL to ELT to discover that dark data, thinking about privacy administration first, even though that might sound boring, it's essential. I want to thank you for the time today. Thanks for having me. And I hope this is just the beginning of a conversation that people will reach out to you. In fact, if they want to hear more stories just like this one, click on the link down below. Until next time, I'm Bruno Ziza.